Hi everybody, welcome back. We're looking today at Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek, and we're in chapter 10. If you have got this far, having done all the previous videos in this uh, course, then you have done really, really well. Well done. But you probably, as you turn the page to the start of chapter 10, you may have found your eyes slightly glazing over, especially if you're one of those people who, certainly like me when I first learned Greek, you don't have a formal training in English grammar because we're looking today at a subject of complex sentences and this chapter introduces a whole bunch of new grammatical concepts which may be unfamiliar to you. Weird thing is you use them all the time and so if we can start to illustrate them, which is what I'm going to do in this video, you will find they're not as complicated as you might have feared. You'll actually learn some useful English grammar and will certainly be able to make progress in this chapter. So let's get straight to it. I'm going to just introduce the, a couple of key grammatical concepts here. And then we're going to do some examples together and you'll soon see it's really not so complicated. Now, I want you to think for a second about the words who and which. How do we use the words who and which in English? Well, sometimes we use them in questions like uh, who is your teacher and which cake shall I eat? We're not talking about that use. We're talking about the use of who and which to join two sentences together. Take a look at these examples and you'll see very quickly what I mean. Just look at these two sentences. I see the child, first sentence, the child is eating the cake. I see the child, the child is eating the cake. Now press pause on the video and see if you can figure out how you could join these two sentences together into a single sentence. The clue is in the colours of green right there. So how would you join these two sentences together into a single sentence? Okay, did you pause the video? Hope you did. And I hope you could see that you would you can very easily join these two sentences together, I'll leave that there, by getting rid of the child and replacing the child with the word who. I see the child who is eating the cake. Make sense? Very straightforward. Now, what have we done here? Well, what we've done, and this is now to introduce some technical terms for you, we've taken two separate sentences and we've combined them together into a single complex sentence. Now, what is a complex sentence? Well, a complex sentence is a sentence with at least one dependent clause or subordinate clause. Take a look at this. I see the child who is eating the cake. The clause who is eating the cake is a complete clause. It has a subject and a verb. Is eating is the verb and all this a uh, 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 bunch of words need in order to be a sentence and thus a clause um, is a verb is eating but it's dependent upon this clause in order to make sense in English. You can't just say who is eating the cake in English, unless you mean who as a question word, we don't mean that. You can't just say who is eating the cake on its own. It's not independent, it's dependent upon this clause, I see the child, which is an independent clause or a main clause. This one can stand on its own, whereas this one cannot. Okay. Now, how do we join them together? Very, very simple. We join them together with the word who, and who is an example of a relative pronoun. Let me say all that again, just in a slightly different way, just in case you didn't get it. We started with two separate sentences. I see the child, the child is eating the cake. We joined them together using a relative pronoun into a single complex sentence which consists of a main clause, I see the child, also known as an independent clause, and a subordinate clause, who is eating the cake, also known as a dependent clause. This is one way of making a complex sentence. All good so far? Right. This chapter is all about this particular way of making complex sentences. In effect, by joining two sentences together using relative pronouns. Let's give another example just down here, and you'll see another slightly different way in which this structure can arise. 
Here's two more sentences, completely separate, independent sentences. I see the cake. The child is eating the cake. Now, you can see the clues again with the green and the green. Can you see how you could join these two separate sentences together to form a single sentence, a complex sentence, in a similar sort of way to we did with this example? But this time I'll give you a clue. You're going to use the word which. Just press pause on the video and see if you can do it. Right. All straightforward, yeah? Did you see how to do it? In this case, we crossed out the child and replaced the child with who. In this case, we're going to cross out the cake and replace the cake with which. In English, which always or almost always goes at the point where the two clauses bump into each other. And so we write it here. I see the cake which the child is eating. And of course, to make it really good English, you should remove the capital letter from that T. You see what we've done again. In this case, I see the cake which the child is eating is a complex sentence consisting of a main clause or an independent clause and a relative pronoun beginning a subordinate clause. Oops, not going, not going that far. We cross that out. A subordinate clause or dependent clause. This clause is subordinate to this one or dependent upon this one. And now what we've done is we've combined the meaning of the two sentences again. I see the cake, and the cake is the cake that the child is eating. The child is eating that cake, and I join them together. I see the cake which the child is eating. It really is as simple as that. Now, um, there's a bunch of grammatical explanation in Duff um, on pages 111 and following. Read it if that's helpful to you. I'm sure it will be. I'm just going to go through now a few more examples, which are the examples from practice 10.1.1, on page 112 just to ingrain this and you'll soon see it uh, much more clearly if you don't see it now. So give me one second, I'll be right back. Okay, here goes. Three of these examples from Jeremy Duff's book on page 112 and 113 just to ingrain what we've been talking about. Number one, Jesus threw out the man which was, sorry, <clears throat> ah, Jesus threw out the demon which was in the man. What do we have to do here? Well, we have to do the reverse process to what we did just a moment ago where previously we assembled two simple sentences into a complex sentence. Now we need to disassemble this complex sentence into two individual simple sentences. How are we going to do it? Just look at it. Jesus threw out the demon, which, there is a relative pronoun, was in the man. So where's the main clause? Well, that's very simple. Jesus threw out the demon. Now, what do we replace which? with in order to turn this into the other sentence which was originally combined with the main clause to produce a complex sentence. What do we replace this with? Well, we replace what's the thing that was in the man from this previous sentence? The answer is, of course, it's the demon. The demon was in the man. So if I was decomposing this into its two constituent parts, I would do it like this. It's Jesus threw out the demon. The demon was in the man. All make sense? Of course it does. This allows us now to introduce another grammatical concept, which is the concept of the antecedent. We say that the demon is the antecedent of this, rel this relative pronoun. It's the thing in the main clause that the relative pronoun refers back to. The antecedent. So we say the antecedent of this relative pronoun is the demon. So Jesus throughout the demon which was in the man decomposes into Jesus throughout the demon. The demon was in the man. Let's take a look at example number two. I am the man whom you are seeking. I am the man whom you are seeking. How would we do it here? Just press pause, see if you can do it for yourself. Of course, you can do this very easily. I am the man is the main clause. Now here we've got the relative pronoun. 
whom you are seeking. Now, what are we going to do here in order to, set, to produce the sentence that this dependent clause came from? Well, what's the antecedent of whom? What is the thing in the main clause that's the thing you are seeking? Look at the sentence. I'm the man whom you are seeking. Who are you seeking? You're seeking the man, right? So here, the man is the antecedent of whom. So when, we're ask, when we want to generate the original uh, sentence that the dependent clause came from, we need to put the man into this sentence. Where does it go? Well, you are seeking the man. It goes at the end of the sentence. Notice why. It's because it's the object of seeking. You are seeking the man. You is the subject. You are seeking is the verb. And the man is the object. Notice the contrast here. In the first example, the antecedent, the demon, became the subject of the sentence that the dependent clause came from. In the second example, the antecedent, the man, became the object of the sentence that the dependent clause was constructed from. That, incidentally, is the reason why, and here you're going to learn some English grammar, that's the reason why we say whom, not who. I am the man who you are seeking. Now that's bad grammar. I am the man whom you are seeking. Because in English, we still decline relative pronouns for to, to distinguish uh, subject and object. Now that raises the point that we're going to pick up in the next video, which is, of course, in Greek you'd expect they decline relative pronouns uh, in a lot more detail, and we're going to come to that uh, in uh, the next video, as I said, where we'll see the full declension for the relative pronouns, nominative, accusative, genitive, dative, singular, plural, masculine, feminine, and neuter. It's not as complicated as it sounds, but notice here this principle that the relative pronoun declines to show the function that it has in the relative clause. We call this the relative clause. It's the cause, it's the um, dependent clause that's in normally here in the second half of the sentence. And the, the pronoun will decline to show its function in that clause. That's what happens in Greek too. We'll come to that in the next video. Finally, let's just do one more example. She ate the meal which the king sent. She ate the meal which the king sent. Let's see if you can work this one out. Where's the main clause? Just pause the video if that helps you and have a think about it. Okay, so here it is. Here's the main clause. She ate the meal. Here, of course, is the relative pronoun. Now, what is the sentence from which this was constructed, where the uh, dependent clause came from? She ate the meal which the king sent. Well, the king sent what? What did the king send? Well, the king sent the meal. The meal is the antecedent of the relative pronoun which. So we're going to write the meal. And is that the subject or the object in this dependent clause? The answer it is, in the sentence come, that the independent clause comes from, sorry. The answer is, of course, it's the object. The king sent the meal. So the structure of this is a little bit like the structure of this. Um, I'm the man whom you are seeking becomes I'm the man you are seeking the man, object. She ate the meal which the king sent becomes she ate the meal the king sent the meal, object. But notice which does not decline to indicate the difference between subject and object in English. Who declines to whom, which stays as which. 
And so, although in English we do get some subject-object distinction in the relative pronouns, we don't get as much as in Greek. Again, we're going to come to that in the next video. Now, so let's just review this. What, what have we done so far? We've introduced the concept of a complex sentence. And a complex sentence is a sentence which is composed of an independent clause and a dependent clause, which are joined together by a relative pronoun. What you can now do is you can see how to combine two sentences into a single complex sentence, and you can see how to decompose a single complex sentence into the two sentences from which it originally came. Hopefully that's given you a clearer idea of some of the grammatical concepts and some of the practical concepts you're going to need. Don't worry if it's all still a bit fuzzy. Maybe go right back and watch this video again. In the next video, we're going to introduce just the, sh the morphology, how you decline the relative pronoun in Greek. And then we're going to crack on with lots, excuse me, lots and lots more examples. And I promise you it will become very, very straightforward. And you'll start to see the power of this construction in writing and reading Greek sentences. Okay, that'll do you for now. You've done well. Excellent start to chapter 10. It's not an easy chapter, but it's not as difficult as you might think. So keep going 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, and we'll have you reading the New Testament in Greek. No time at all. God bless. Bye for now.